RenderGraph is a system on top of Unity's scriptable render pipeline. It automatically optimizes runtime rendering, and that better performance enables broader and safer access to the pipeline's resources. We can create full screen effects like the custom pass we'll make together in this tutorial because RenderGraph essentially gives us more to work with. In other words, you don't have to sacrifice style for better performance or reliability. You might be familiar with renderer features. A renderer feature can be used in any stage of the pipeline to affect the final render. The final result of this tutorial is effectively a post-processing technique using a material to process each pixel in the image. You can find the example project at the link below, and next to that, pick up the Unity 6 update to our ebook, Universal Render Pipeline for Advanced Unity Creators. We often show different examples in each of our resources to give you several opportunities to practice with the same topic. While in this video we're creating the dither render feature, the online documentation we'll look at later covers creating a blur effect. And then the ebook shows you how to create a full screen color tint. For this tutorial, I'm going to work in a mostly blank scene to keep things simple. Let's get familiar with a new render graph viewer window because then we have some context for the next chapter when we create our own effect. If you go to settings, PC renderer, in the inspector, you can see the Screen Space Ambient Occlusion, or SSAO, feature. If this is new to you, ambient occlusion approximates the shadowing of ambient light we see in real life anywhere objects or surfaces are close together. Let's see where this feature sits in our render pipeline. You can bring up the Render Graph Viewer from Window, Analysis, Render Graph Viewer. RenderGraph is not a visual scripting system like ShaderGraph or VFXGraph. In computer science, graphs are data structures with nodes and connections, and they allow us to understand and work with the system in a more intuitive way, like how we're able to visualize the render pipeline here. The top contains the render passes in the order that URP executes them, and the left is the resources the render passes use in the order that URP creates them. The grid with the colors, these are access blocks that indicate how the render passes use the resources. The blue lines indicate that URP has merged the passes above into a single, more efficient pass. Let's make sense of all this with screen space ambient occlusion as our example. We see the blit SSAO pass here, and if we turn it off to see the updated render graph, we need to click this refresh icon. You might also need to switch to the game view to capture our updated pipeline. And then the SSAO pass is no longer in the pipeline. Let's turn it back on. The SSAO pass is called blit SSAO. And we see that blit word a few places, like here it is in post-processing and bloom. So what's a blit? Blit stands for bit block transfer. Instead of processing pixels individually, blits treat sections of a frame as blocks and apply operations to these entire blocks. And this is a common operation in graphics. The pass is called blit SSAO, and what's meant by that is that the effect is applied as a block operation, efficiently transferring and modifying pixel data from these source textures to create a new texture with the SSAO effect applied. The source textures are the green access blocks, this SSAO pass reads the camera depth texture and the camera normals texture, resources that are processed to determine where the shadowing should happen. And then it reads and writes to these screen space occlusion textures. This globe icon means that the render pass sets this texture as a global resource. Let's take a look at the passes that are being graphed here. We have two tools for that, and both of them are in Window Analysis. There you'll find the Rendering Debugger and the Frame Debugger. The rendering debugger visualizes lighting, rendering, and material properties, and you can customize this with your own visualizations. One of the map overlays that's useful here is the depth overlay. And that might be dark for you, so I'll bring up the near of the clipping plane, which will move the ceiling towards the objects. The frame debugger is for checking the render passes and draw calls in the rendering loop. So here we have information that mirrors the render graph viewer, like the draw depth normal prepass. And we also see the SSAO pass here. The next visible pass is draw opaque objects. And we do see the shadowing on those objects. So let's go back to the render graph viewer and check out this draw opaque objects pass. Here we see that draw opaque objects is in fact reading green block, the SSAO texture. Then if we move on from there, we see that the skybox and copy color ignore it. The skybox is essentially infinitely far away, so shadowing doesn't make sense. 
And shadowing is also not relevant for simple color transfers like the copy color pass. But after these, the texture is read again by draw transparent object. The reason for that is so transparent objects are blended correctly with the opaque objects behind. Say in a game you're looking through a window, it would be weird if the SSAO shadows disappeared on the objects behind. So the texture is used in this pass to maintain consistency in the scene. After this, the resource is no longer used, which makes sense because the shadowing isn't relevant and shouldn't have an influence in regards to something like the bloom effect, for example. All right, now that we've taken a look at a render feature and seen where and why in the pipeline it's used, let's create our own renderer feature. We'll need to create a script. Since I'm in a blank project, I'll just create the script in the assets folder. Right click and choose create, rendering, URP renderer feature. And give it the name dither effect renderer feature. Double click this. And it's a C sharp script containing boilerplate for a renderer feature. We have two classes here. The render feature manages the lifecycle and configuration of the passes. And there might be multiple passes in a feature. Custom render pass defines the actual rendering logic, what the render pass does, the drawing or rendering actions. So the render pass is the worker class, while the feature is the manager class setting up the job. It'll help us here to take a quick look at the documentation because there's a useful example of creating a blur effect render feature. The render feature class here declares some settings the horizontal and vertical blur intensity that we can set in the inspector. The feature creates an instance of the blur render pass, configures the pass to be injected before post-processing, and then the feature enqueues or adds the pass to the pipeline. The blur render pass class does the work. Inside render pass classes, there's a record render graph method which Unity runs every frame once for each camera. The method in this example defines how the blur effect is applied to the scene, using horizontal and vertical passes to achieve the blur. Okay, I hope that helps orient ourselves a little bit here. Let's go back to our dither effect. Rename custom render pass to dither effect pass. This isn't necessary, but it makes the code more readable. Add two properties to the class. The pass name is useful when debugging, and the material will contain the shader you apply to the current state of the rendered image. Next, we have a pass data class we actually don't need, because pass data defines the data used when we declare the pass, the data that the rendering code can access. But we don't need any additional data for this particular pass. Instead, let's create a setup function that allows the render feature to set the material for our dither effect. The dither effect needs to read the current color texture of the scene, everything that's been rendered so far. Ideally, we'd want to apply our effect directly to the final output, maybe like putting some trippy effect on the master track of a music recording. Unfortunately, we can't directly use the final output, the back buffer, as an input for the effect. Instead, we'll need to work with an intermediate texture. So this requires intermediate texture being set to true. It tells Unity to automatically create this working copy for us. We could set this in the render feature above, but it's good practice to make the pass self-contained, handling its own setup. This allows the pass to be added to the rendering queue from any mono behavior script. We're not limited to using it only as a part of a render feature. Delete the function execute pass and then scroll down below record render graph to delete on-camera setup, execute, and on-camera cleanup. We don't use these with render graph and they'll eventually be deprecated. Now let's go back up and focus on the record render graph function. Delete everything inside and let's start from the bottom actually because it helps frame what we're working towards. We want our dither effect pass to blit full screen draw the current camera color buffer to a temporary texture while applying our effect material. The final line involves swapping the camera color buffer with our modified texture. When we swap universal resource data dot camera color with our modified texture, future passes will automatically reference our modified version without needing additional blit operations. Now that we know where we're going, let's start from the top. We want the dither effect to only happen inside a volume. Let's first get the volume manager stack and then a custom sphere volume component. And we actually need to create this. So in your project, create a new script called sphere volume component and copy all of this. 
Back in the dither effect render a feature script, if the sphere volume component is not active, then we can return without doing anything. When the volume component is active, we continue on to inject the dither effect pass. First, we get a resource data instance, which is our access point to all the renderer's texture handles. We'll soon need the camera's color buffer for our source. Let's add a safety check to ensure that resource data is active target back buffer is false. If true, we can't use an intermediate texture, so we should log the error and return. Later, I'm going to trigger this error, which will help us make sense of this. Next, we get the source, the active color texture inside resource data. We'll use this texture in our blit operation, but we also want to use its properties when we create our destination texture. Render textures contain their properties inside a render texture descriptor struct. The dimensions, for example, is something we want to match the source. We'll customize two things, though. We want the name of the destination texture to fit the pass, and we also want the clear buffer to be false. We don't want a blank slate. Our goal is to modify. And now we can create the destination texture handle with the descriptor parameters. At this point, we have everything we need for our blit operation. We have the source, the destination, and the blit material we declared above. We also use the shader pass 0, which is the default. Since there are many possible blit parameters, Unity provides this helper struct to make configuration easier. Render graph utils requires an additional using import at the start of the file. With the parameter set up, we can add our pass. Render graph gives us ways to add different kinds of passes, and we want to use add blit pass. This is what actually executes the blit using our material. And finally, we've reached the last line we talked about at the start, where we swap in the modified texture. Now let's move out to the render feature class and add some properties. Render pass event allows the user to set up the injection point in the inspector, and there's 18 possible injection points. They can go before and after the rendering, shadows, prepasses, and so on. You should do after rendering post processing as the injection point. But I'm going to do after rendering, and I'm doing this to show you the case where we get that error log we wrote above in the record render graph method about the is active target back buffer. Next, we need to define the material that will be used when applying the screen space effect. If you switched over to Unity at this point and added the dither render feature, you'd see the material and injection point as parameters. Next, let's use our injection point in the create method. You'll need to update the add render passes method. If there's no material, then log a warning and return. Call the setup method for the pass with the material as a parameter. And that completes the render feature. Let's go back into Unity and add this render feature to our universal render data. Click Add Render Feature, and then look for the dither effect render feature. And there it is. If you're following along from scratch, you'll need to make the dither shader for the material slot here. But before we do that, let's create the volume that will activate the pass. In your hierarchy, right click and go to Volume, Sphere, Volume. And then for the volume profile, if I use this sample scene profile, this is also the profile that's in my universal render pipeline asset. So it functions like a global volume. Let's instead make a volume profile that is just for this local sphere volume. Right click in the project folder, create, rendering, volume profile. And I'll just call this local profile. Let's add this to the sphere volume. And then let's ensure that everything is working by adding something very noticeable from post-processing, like a really heavy film grain. And then let's drag the sphere volume to the camera to see the effect. Earlier, we created a new post-processing component called sphere volume component that has an intensity parameter. We need that here for our effect to work. Let's add that, click on Add Override, and inside custom, there's the sphere volume component. Then bring up your intensity. And once the shader is complete, you'll see this effect, but we haven't created the shader yet. So let's go ahead and do that next. In the sample, the shader is called two tone dither. And it's not that complicated, so you can easily copy it. Start by making a shader, right click, go to create, shader graph, URP and full screen shader graph. And then let me bring mine up. 
The input properties are a float step threshold that defaults to zero, dither scale, another float that can default to 0.5 or 1, kind of depends on your scene and camera. And then we have two color properties, color A and color B. Starting with the dither node, this node takes two inputs, a float value assumed to be between 0 and 1, and a screen position. The screen position can be adjusted using the dither scale. A URP sample buffer node using blitz source is processed using a custom function node called luminance, which provides the first input to the dither node. I'll zoom in on that luminance function so you can see that better. We use a step node with the edge set to the step threshold value and input set to the output from the dither node. We use a lerp node to choose between the two colors for the final fragment base color. Save the shader and then back in the project folder, create a material with the shader or you can just expand the shader and drop the material in the render feature material slot. And that gives me an error that I was talking about earlier. This is the error log we created because we can't do this pass at the end of the pipeline where it would be using the back buffer. Instead, I'll change the injection point to after rendering post-processing where an intermediate color texture can be used. Clear the error and we're good. If you make a material and add the shader to it, you can, of course, change the parameters. Now, if for some reason this isn't working for you still, you may need to ensure that render graph is enabled. To check that, go to Edit, Project Settings, Graphics, Render Graph, and then go to Compatibility Mode. That needs to be unchecked. Finally, let's return to the render graph viewer where we started. And there, after blit post-processing, we see our dither effect pass. Scroll down to the bottom, and we see it creates or writes to the camera color dither effect pass resource. Let's refer back to the script now that we can see this here. Record render graph is where we created this destination texture. And in the descriptor, we gave it the name camera color pass name. Moving on to the next and final pass before UI overlays, this resource is read by the blit final to back buffer. Now that we've come this far, creating other full screen effects is easy. Just swap the material out for another full screen shader, like this color tint. And why stop there? We can do a checkerboard filter or some scan lines. Render graph is tremendously flexible in how it gives us easy access to the render pipeline. We try our best with these videos, but there's no replacement for having step-by-step -step info on a page and going at your own pace like you can do with the eBooks. Additionally, you may have noticed a frame buffer fetch group in the dither effect shader graph that we skipped over. This is covered in the eBook because for mobile platforms targeting DirectX 12, Vulkan, and Metal, frame buffer fetch is much faster because it uses the frame buffer on chip memory of the GPU rather than video memory. One final trick before we go. If you inject the dither pass before post-processing, you can use focus distance and depth of field for an easy sci-fi scan effect.